Uh, but in February, we talked about pursuing Jesus. Uh, this month, right up until Easter, we're going to talk about how pursuing Jesus causes us to be different. And I'm not talking about the kind of different, right, when someone whispers behind your back, um, or as you native Southerners say, well, bless their heart. That's not what we're talking about, all uh, right? Because uh, we all know someone who's different. We're not going to point fingers today. But Christians have known for a long time that we are called to live differently, right? That we are called to walk a fine line and like not that line that Johnny Cash sang about, right? We're, we're, we're called to walk a line. Everybody under 40 has no clue what I just said. <laughs> we're to be in this world, but we're not to be of this world. In 1 Peter 2.9, here's what it says. You are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Now, I grew up hearing, maybe you did too if you grew up in church, uh, that we're called to be set apart. I've heard that a whole lot, Uh, which I kind of thought as a kid meant that I had to be weird, right? The Christians were just weird, but that that wasn't it at all. In Deuteronomy 14.2, which is one of the first times we see this in Scripture, it says, you have been set apart as holy to the Lord your God, and he has chosen you from all the nations of the earth to be his own special treasure. So God's people have always been special. We've always been chosen. We've been holy. We've been, not because we're holy, because God makes us holy. And we've been set apart from the world's way of thinking and the world's way of behaving. Unfortunately, I think all too often, uh, it's pretty easy to blur the lines between what is acceptable and what is unnecessary. And, you know, here's a... <laughs> Here's an example that's sure to make some people in the room uncomfortable and maybe even disagreeable with me, but you know me by now. Why should I change? Um, I heard many people say something like this. What a wonderful halftime show it was this year at this year's Super Bowl. I heard wonderful people in this church. Oh, it was so good. It was so clean. And I hadn't seen it. So I thought, hey, I'll go back and check it out. Songs about sex and sleeping around, tons of half-naked people, a whole lot more sexual, suggestive dancing. Oh, and let's not forget about the stripper poles. It just got quiet. Now, don't start throwing things at me. I hope you left those forgiveness rocks at home that we gave out a few weeks ago. (laughs) And I actually asked someone about it after I had watched pieces of it. And here's what this person said to me. Oh, and they were sincere. They said, oh, I didn't notice that. And that's what happens when little bit by little bit we allow lines to blur. Things that should bother us don't even catch our attention anymore. You know what I'm talking about. There's things on television programs that when I was a kid, if we would have seen then... I mean, everyone would have made a mad dash to the TV to turn it off. Now we say things like, well, it's everywhere, don't we? And before you get all judgmental on me, this is not a message about legalism. We're going to talk about that in a second. That's not what this is. Because I get it, right? We're inundated by a culture that has no respect for God. It has no godliness. It's everywhere, TV, music, videos, movies, magazines, and certainly anything you look at online. And at some point, the church decided that being different didn't mean having to actually be different. Right? And we've talked about, well, you know, because of the Holy Spirit inside us, that people will just know something's different about us. Well, I believe that's true. But if the Holy Spirit is inside of us, how many of you believe that it will actually make a difference on the outside of us? Right? It's not just something that's eternal. It's something that, or internal, excuse me, it manifests itself externally. And again, relax. This isn't a message about legalism. Uh, because Jesus fulfilled the law. Because living set apart is really a heart issue. 
right? One that desires to be more like Jesus and less like the world around us. Why? Because when you walk in those doors, it tells you why. When you look at these walls out here on either side, it tells you why. Because our mission is to love people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. It's to lead people to Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, as believers, there's probably more, but we're going to talk about four today. There's four basic responsibilities of living our lives set apart as unto the Lord, as people of God. The first one, and we've talked about all this before, the first one is holding fast to God's truth. In 1 John 2.24, it says this, So you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. And if you do, you will remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. Remember, read Scripture backwards sometimes. So what this says is, is that if we do not remain faithful to what we've been taught, we will not remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. Right? And so we as believers, we accept the Bible as the absolute word of God. And then we ask the Holy Spirit to help us live by all of its standards, whether we personally happen to like them or not. And I've confessed to you before, there's things in the Bible, my God, why did you do it that way? But he did, and he's wise, much wiser than we are. And so we accept his wisdom and we remain faithful to the truth that we've been taught. The second thing is living with an attitude, as believers, living with an attitude of complete humility. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, it says this, Since God shows you to be holy people that he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Right? And this is about evidencing the fruit of the Spirit as proof that we're growing as disciples of Jesus. I saw something, I think I shared it on Facebook yesterday, about this long line for people signing up for class to learn how to function in the gifts of the Spirit, but the line for the fruit of the Spirit being pretty short or non-existent. Because the glamour is over here, the character is over here. And I would even dare say we shouldn't be operating in the gifts unless we have a foundation of the fruit. The fruit has to come first. And it's, excuse me, it's not either or. Right? You don't have to pick. We need both, but you can't have <coughs> excuse me. You can't have effective prophetic gifts unless there's a foundation of fruit in our life. Love, joy, peace. You know the list. Right? So the fruit has to be evidence of our character, and humility is one of those. Uh, thirdly, we have to serve others as Jesus did. In Matthew chapter 20, we're going to come back to this. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 27 and 28, Jesus said, Whoever wants to become first among you must serve the rest of you like a slave. Now, don't get tied up in that word. Uh, in the same way, the Son of Man did not come to be served. He came to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is about prioritizing the needs of other people ahead of our own comfort. And the fourth one that the Holy Spirit gave me this past week was speaking the truth where needed. Now, I want you to pay attention to this one. In Ephesians 4, 15 through 16, it says this, Speaking the truth with love. We will grow, and we all, we've all heard that. It's been quoted to us. We've said it to other people. Speaking the truth with love, we will grow up in every way into Christ, who is the head. The whole body depends on Christ, and all the parts of the body are joined and held together. Each part does its own work to make the whole body grow and be strong with love. That's why the people that are downstairs right now working with kids, I'm no more important than they are. Right? They're fulfilling their role. In fact, most of us would rather be here than there. His kids are in our call. Actually, that's not true. Most of you wouldn't want to be up here either. Uh, but, you know, we all, we all fulfill what the gifts that, that God has, has given us. But what I want you to see in this passage is that this scripture is very clearly directed to believers. Right? It is not about speaking the truth in love to unbelievers. Because the Bible tells us elsewhere that without the Holy Spirit, that people don't have the ability to comprehend spiritual truths. That's why trying to win a doctrine battle with someone who's not a believer is pointless. That's why Paul said, I determined just to preach Jesus. Right? We, we, those discussions we can have as believers. And so this idea of 
trying to set people straight because we think their political views are wrong, that, that's not the point. the point. If they're not a believer, we can't even have biblical discussions because there's no revelation for them to even understand what we're saying. So this speak the truth in love doesn't apply to people outside the church. Speak the truth in love applies to those of us that are inside the church as we iron sharpen iron and we help each other grow. And that's why until people choose to follow Jesus and become disciples, nothing but the gospel of salvation matters. So our job outside these walls is just to share Jesus, just to share the gospel. So these are four things of living set apart under, under God. Let me just say them again real quickly. Holding fast to God's truth, living with an attitude of complete humility, serving others as Jesus did, and then speaking to each other the truth where needed. But we'll never truly live set apart until we choose to believe Jesus in Jesus totally and completely in every area of our lives. I asked you a couple of weeks ago, because it was asked of me, what areas in our life have we not fully surrendered to God? I want to take you to a story where Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's making this very point about living set apart. But let me set it up for you. So Jesus has been walking uh, and teaching uh, his disciples uh, for, for quite some time. And they show up to this place, you've probably seen it in scripture, it's called Caesarea Philippi. So named um, after uh, Caesar's brother Philip, uh, that's where that name came from, if I'm remembering that correctly. So Caesarea Philippi, and it's a hill in Judea uh, overlooking, so imagine being up on a hill, and overlooking an area of Roman idol worship. Right, so remember that the Romans had come in, they had, they had you know, taken over, they'd conquered, they were ruling, the Jews wanted you know, the Messiah to show up and overthrow the Romans, and so Jesus takes them to this hill, Caesarea Philippi, where they can see the Roman idol, the place of Roman idol worship uh, down below. And this place, if you look through history, was considered um, very wicked, uh, very dark, <coughs> excuse me, anybody got that cough that's just hanging on and won't go away? Uh, considered wicked and, and dark by the Jews. And so this area represents the false religions of the world. And so many people uh, came to the temples that they erected there, uh, worshiped the idols there in ways we won't even talk about this morning, uh, hoping for favor and blessing from their gods. And so it's in this setting that Jesus begins to unpack a spiritual truth for them. And so let's start in Matthew chapter 16, and so we'll start at verse 13. These scriptures will be on the screen if you need them. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, I know in modern English, that's not great grammar, but we'll go with it. In other words, they're already worshiping a whole lot of gods in this, in this area. Uh, so Jesus is saying, what do they think of me? Am I just one more on their list? Or do they see something different? In verse 14, it says, Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And I mean, maybe that's good because those answers are coming from Scripture. At least they're you know, staying within the confines of their, of their own religion. And then in verse 15, it says, Then he asked them, But who do you say I am? Now, notice that Jesus didn't even entertain a discussion about who other people said he was because that didn't matter. That wasn't the point of what he was trying to do. The world's opinion didn't really matter in the long run. So he moves right along to the thing that actually matters, what the disciples are thinking. Verse 16, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. So here's the point, right? This was a verbal commitment from Simon Peter, and then eventually the rest of the disciples all say the same thing, to not only believe in Jesus as the promised Messiah, but to literally choose to follow him with their very lives. Remember later, you know, Peter's like, oh, you know, I'll die for you. And Jesus is like, yeah, you will. I've often wondered what Peter thought after that. Because their faith would later be put to the test, and boy, they would fail many, many times, just as you and I have. But that rock of truth that he was the Messiah, it would still be in their spirits. And if you hear nothing else today, I want you to hear this, because let me, let me set this up for you just for a minute. 
the way that many of us grew up in what I tend to call, what I call Pentecostal holiness. And when I say that, I'm not making fun. I'm not throwing stones. I think there was value in much of that. But what we grew up with was this idea that our holiness was determined by our outward actions. Right? And so if you were holy, let's talk about my upbringing, uh, if you were holy, you didn't go to movies. Right? If you were holy, you didn't mix swim. You know what I'm talking about? If you were holy, you didn't play card games. Well, you could play Rook. Rook was like the Christian version of cards. <laughs> right? If you were a woman and you were holy, you didn't cut your hair. If you were a woman and holy, you didn't wear makeup. Right? And either gender, if you were holy, you didn't wear shorts because we all know knees are way too attractive. <laughs> and there were all these things that determined our holiness. But do you remember when Jesus was talking about the fact that you could make the outside of the dish all clean, but if the inside was still dirty, you still had a dirty dish? And so, What's happened in recent years is a lot of folks, not everybody, there's a lot of folks that still live like that, um, but figured out that that wasn't true. And so that pendulum that was way over here swung way over here, and now we teach a gospel where nothing matters as long as you love Jesus. And we no longer talk about being set apart. We no longer talk about what holiness looks like. And so Jesus is trying to, you know, bring some truth to this. But here's the, here's the sentence that I want you to hear as we kind of head into the meat. And I've got an illustration for you. Living set apart isn't defined by perfection. I can't tell you how many times, as a, especially as a teenager, that, you know, I would have the wrong thought or would be tempted to go, you know, do whatever. And I would feel so convicted because if I were really, really mature in my faith, I wouldn't even have those thoughts. Right? If I was really mature in my faith, uh, I wouldn't be tempted. I would have risen above such things. How many of you know that's a lie? Right? As long as you're on this planet, the enemy's coming for you. And Pastor Eddie did a great job last week of talking about how to deal with those thoughts when they, when they come. And so, we're way over here now in modern church culture and I think the Holy Spirit would have a swing back to what the word actually says. But leaving the part isn't set apart by perfection. I would, I would feel like such a, such a failure, like God didn't love me anymore. And like if the, that was the moment that God sent Gabriel to blow the trumpet, that I was just out of luck. And, that, that's, that's, that was, and I'm not even blaming my parents for that. that that's just that, that, the, the environment we were in, that, that's just how, how I interpreted things. So living set apart isn't defined by perfection. It's about asking the Holy Spirit, listen to this, to reveal any areas in our lives that still aren't fully submitted to him and asking for his help to bring them into alignment with the word of God. Again, what areas have we not fully surrendered to the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's about asking the Holy Spirit to help us hold fast to truth, like we talked about at the beginning, to live in humility, to serve as Jesus did, to speak truth to each other as is necessary. And so, you know, to this point, Jesus says something to his disciples that was very, very hard for them to hear. And here's what he says, and this is in the same chapter, it's in the same conversation. Look at what Jesus says to them in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, and I'm going to read it to you the way that we tend to teach it these days. If any of you wants to be my follower, just ask me into your heart. Actually, you can't find that phrase anywhere in Scripture. The concept of inviting Jesus into our heart isn't even biblical. We, you can't find it. Here's what Jesus actually said. If any of you wants to be my follower, another translation might say my disciple, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross. Remember, the cross only meant one thing to them. Death. Crucifixion. You must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow 
me. I imagine when Jesus said that, things got really quiet. Really quiet. You know, years ago, and if you ushers can come help me, uh, years ago, the Holy Spirit gave me a, uh, an illustration about being set apart unto God. See, because the question of being set apart unto, unto holiness is really, no one's even looking at me right now. You're all looking to see what the ushers are doing over there. Um, the, the question of being set apart unto holiness is really simple. Do we see it as walking the line as close to the world, close to enjoyment as we can get, or do we see it as getting as far from the line as close to Jesus as we can? So, um, by the way, I don't know if the Malones are here today. Do not judge me. Don't hold up, you know, cards and tell me I got to, what my score is because that's not going to be good. Um, and by the way, I think Grace Johnson is here today. There, oh, there you gonna, You got your cards ready for a 10.0, baby. That's where we're going right now. Um, we also have in our, in our church family, I think she's here today, uh, Grace Johnson. Grace was a gymnast, competed at Division I, uh, University of Georgia Bulldogs. I expected the Georgia fans to say something there. I don't know. Um, got a perfect 10.0 in competition on the balance beam, Division I collegiate gymnastics. So... Here is how most of us tend to think about how we live. Okay, now this is, we'll do, we'll do my left and, and, uh, and your right. So let's just assume for a minute that this side, I'm sorry to all you sitting in this section, um, that this is the kingdom of unrighteousness over here, right? This is, this is, this is where the enemy operates, kingdom of unrighteousness, right? On this side over here, it's because Pastor Shelton's sitting here. <laughs> this is the kingdom of righteousness. Oh, wait, whoa, I forgot Chris was sitting over here. And here is how most of us think about approaching our spiritual life, right? Now, if I fall off, it's on purpose. If I don't, then I did a good job. Um, we, uh, we get up here, right? You're all really nervous right now. Hey, by the way, I just remembered, I practiced this on Thursday, and let's just say doing this with bifocals is not a good idea. <laughs> here is how I have no pocket. These are going in my pocket. There we go. Here's how most of us approach, and yes, I know my form isn't right, just sit down. <laughs> Here's how most of us approach this. This is what's wrong. This is what's right. And we do our absolute best to not fall off on this side. We do. We don't want to give in to that temptation. We don't want to look at that thing that we shouldn't be looking at. Watch this, go that place, drink the excess, right? So we do our best that we can to, to walk this line. And we do our best to, man, because we don't, because what happens though is inevitably, inevitably, something happens. This is going to end up on Instagram, isn't it? I know it is. All the phones came out. And even though we do our best, to walk this line the best we can. And we do it with sincerity. Holy Spirit, help me. Help me, Lord. I don't want to fall into that anymore. I don't want to give in to those things anymore. That's the old man. It's passed away. And yet somehow I still struggle. God, would you help me? And he does. He's faithful. But eventually, because we still live in this world and because sin is still a thing, Right? We end up teetering. By the way, I've only ever done this illustration one other time, and that time I used a four by four. I'm smarter. This is a four by six. I gave myself a little more real estate up here today. I got big feet. But what happens is, despite our best efforts, something happens. We 
begin to teeter. And before we know it, we've fallen over here. And you know what happens right here? Guilt, shame, depression. I'm never gonna get this right. No matter how much I tried to get that right and not fall over here, man, it, it happened again. God, I'm useless. God, I'm worthless. And if we're not careful, at some point, that will keep us from getting back on the beam and doing the best we can to walk this again. But I suggest to you, see, because this is, this is what I grew up with. Holiness is on this side. Unholiness is on this side. Righteousness is here. Unrighteousness is over here. So if I want to be a good Christian and not disappoint God, then, you know, then I don't go to the movies. And I, then I don't do all those things that I kind of made fun of, but I was actually serious. Right? I, I don't do those things over here. And I do my best, man, to, to not fall off on that side. Because if I give the devil an inch, can I suggest to you that this is the complete wrong way to think about it. Because if our definition of holiness is walking the line and trying to do the things we should do and not do the things that we shouldn't do, we're going to spend our lives in tension like this. I would suggest to you that as believers, if Jesus is over here, we shouldn't even be close to the line. The point of righteousness, of holiness, and being so in love with Jesus is living a life that is as close to God as I can possibly get. And the closer I get to him, right, the more that I long for his presence, the more that I deeply desire for my life to reflect his glory, then I'm nowhere even near where this behavior is that if I just make a slight twinge, I'm in trouble. See, this is why it's a hard issue. It's not about a list of on this side are the right things and on this side are the bad things. By the way, to be clear, we all have a list because the Holy Spirit tells us, I mean, Paul told us in Scripture that the Holy Spirit tells us what things are right for us and what things are wrong for us. And there might be some things in this room that are right for some people, but they're wrong for you. And that's okay. Because the Holy Spirit, I mean, obviously there's clear rights and wrongs. We understand that. I have someone, they all, the question I always get as a, as a pastor is, oh, pastor, can Christians drink? You know, I'll just go ahead and answer it right now so I can make half the room mad. Um, you know, the Bible never tells us not to drink. It doesn't. The Bible is very clear about not being drunk. However, the Bible also tells us to walk away from anything that would lead us astray and move closer to Jesus. So if there's things in your life that opens that door, by all means, close that door. Put that on your do not do list. Right? We try to make people live by our list. You know, the Holy Spirit will give you your list. And there's things that you can do I cannot. Do you know why? Because I'm the pastor of this church. There's things I can't do. You'll never catch me alone in a car with another woman. You'll never catch me at Starbucks with another woman without my wife there or someone else being there. Why? Because appearances can change everything, right? And so we got to listen to the Holy Spirit. But I spent so much of my life trying to walk this beam when, Holy, when Jesus is over here going, get away from the line. Just come here. Just come be with me. Just come where I am. Be so in love with me that the line is a blur in the past and you just want to spend all your time in my presence because this, this, I mean, this is where it is. This is where joy is. This is where peace is. This is where hope is. It's over here. And I just fear, myself included at times, that our desire for things over here keeps us on this line. If you're walking up here, you ask anybody who's trained on a balance beam, you're going to fall. You're going to fall. What if we just lived our lives in such a way that we allow the Holy Spirit to draw us and pull us closer and closer and closer to him where those things don't even matter anymore? 
See, it's not about laying, at this point, it's not about laying things down because they're sin. It's about laying things down because they won't get me closer to Jesus. Right? It's not about, it's about whether I can you know, still get into heaven and do those things. It's about those things are holding me back and they're taking up too much of my time. And that could be anything. Video games, guys, aren't bad until they consume you. Well, it depends on the video game. Right? But if it's keeping you from your devotional time with Jesus, in fact, no, Holy Spirit, if you're spending more time playing those games than you are in the word and worship, you probably have an idol in your life. But that goes for everything else as well. Anything that takes too much time in our life that keeps us from the things that truly matter is an idol because we're given that more time than we're given to our pursuit of Jesus. See, that is holiness. That is being set apart. That's why we don't spend a whole lot of time teaching on do this, don't do that. We trust the Holy Spirit to do that. What we want is people to fall in love with Jesus, myself included, so much that, man, I spend all my time over here. Where my back is on that beam, where I don't even care anymore. Where I'm so in love with Jesus and so in love with his presence that even the okay things don't matter anymore. Because I, I just, well, as the old hymn says, th those things just, they, they grow dim. They don't hold their attraction anymore. Does that make sense today? Yeah. Team, why don't you guys come on? So. Where do we want to walk? Let me be clear. Just in case someone took that wrong, we're not preaching a salvation by works today. This isn't about getting your to-do list, your don't and your do list right, so God will love you. So we're not saved by works. But I want to live a life that is set apart. Why? Number one, to please my Father. And two, so that others see Jesus in me. Right? Where is the Holy Spirit asking us today to lay some things down. And again, we're not necessarily talking about sin. It might be. It might be. And if you hold on to it after the Holy Spirit's asking you to let go of it, then it becomes sin. But we're talking about what are those things that are just cluttering up our life that we need to lay down, raise our standards so that people can see Jesus in us. You know, I heard a pastor say at a conference that I was at this past week, and it was a good example. Uh, he was talking about being an arrow. In, a, in God's quiver and he says you know sometimes God keeps you in the quiver until he can straighten the shaft and you know you'll fly straight so he keeps you in, in you know in, in privacy where people don't see you uh, until it's time you know, the work's been done on you and, and I get that it, 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 was a, it was a fine example but as I was sitting there I heard something rise up in me because he was talking about you know we all have you know we're all bent in certain way because of sin and things I said, man, that sounds good, but I don't want to just be straightened. I want to be broken. I want to be broken. In Psalm 51, I don't have this on the slide, but in Psalm 51, 17, this is David after he has sinned with Bathsheba and he's getting his heart right. And he says, you do not desire a sacrifice, right? Offer one. He's talking about it as atonement for sin. It says, you do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. And you will not reject a broken and repentant heart, oh God. Church, I want, and I want us, I, I just want us to be set apart for his use. I don't want to live my life in such a way that I'm constantly trying to figure out if I'm, you know, I, I just want to find Jesus and I just want to move that direction. So I want us to pray today and we're going to open, we're going to open the altars and I'm going to encourage you to respond. Now, if there, if there is some kind of sin in your life that you need to give to the Lord and ask for his help and surrender to him, then great, then this is for you. But I think for a lot of us, it's willing to make that step and say, Father, there's some things in my life that I know are not necessarily sin. But for me to step into all that you have for me, for me to live the life that you're calling me to live, to be effective to those that are around me, to love people into a life-changing relationship with you, for me to become all you're calling me to be, 
there's some things that I've got to surrender. I don't know what that is, but I trust the Holy Spirit to begin to speak to you. See, because Paul said about his life, he said, my life is a living sacrifice to be poured out for you. And as long as we're holding on to things where our, our pleasures, our enjoyments, our priorities are keeping us from stepping into all that God has for us, I mean, we're still gonna get into heaven, but, but we're gonna miss out on a whole lot that he wants to do through our life here on earth. I just wanna encourage you with this one simple truth. And it may not sound like an encouragement, but it is a truth. Our lives are not our own. The Bible says our lives are not our own. We've been bought with a price. And it's a price that we can never repay. Therefore, all we have left to offer is us. All we have left to offer is our lives. Father, we know that there is a world that needs to hear of just how great and wonderful and amazing and faithful and good you are. Father, would you, with the help of the Holy Spirit, give us the courage to walk away from the line. Oh, I hear that in my spirit today. Give us the courage with the power, the help of the Holy Spirit to walk away from the line. That our thought process would no longer be, can I, should I, can't I? It's, is this going to get me closer to my creator? Is this going to get me closer to the one who gave his life for me? May the focus of our life become pursuing your presence. May the focus of our life become encountering you in prayer. May the focus of our life become operating in the power of the Holy Spirit because we have spent time in your presence. Father, we commit again today to give ourselves away. Our life is yours. Take it. Use it as you will. This life is a vapor. It's going to be over in a half a second compared to eternity. Let us not get so attached to earthly things that we miss out on giving our lives to the things that will actually matter for eternity. Father, help us to be set apart, not weighed down by some crazy list of rules that somebody else puts on us, but by listening to the Holy Spirit and walking according to the way that you reveal to us. Draw us into your presence, Lord. Take our life. Let it be consecrated, Lord, unto thee. That is our prayer today. I want to speak this blessing over you today. If you're still praying, please, by all means, you stay and pray. I'm not even done. I don't think praying in my spirit yet, but I want to speak this over you today. I also want to remind you we've got prayer tonight between 5 and 7 at the prayer center. If you'd like to drop by for part of that, just be in God's presence with us. But I want to speak this over you. If you're new to our church, we believe in the power of the blessing. And so I raise my right hand as I give it. And our body raises their right hand to receive it. Because we believe in the power of words. Be blessed as you choose to be different. Asking the Holy Spirit to help you live a life that is set apart unto God. Be blessed as you realize that being set apart isn't about legalism to earn salvation or perfection to prove your worth. Because Jesus has already settled that once and for all. Be blessed as you understand that being set apart is about becoming a growing follower of Jesus who leads others to the grace of God. Be blessed as you go today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stay and pray if you like. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night. So I give my